I have this awesome, amazing, gorgeous, wonderful woman as a guest. I love her. She is Canada's dating coach on TikTok. So what's like the one, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of advice you could give, but is there anything that sticks out more than anything that you can give for advice? Yes, absolutely. The number one piece of advice is to meditate. Meditation helps you when you're single and you're dating because a lot of us are anxiously choosing partners. Like I'm stressed about single. My biological clock is ticking. I'm worried no one is going to love me, right? I'm worried I'm not going to find somebody who is as good as my last partner, as shitty as they were, right? Mm -hmm. And so meditation shrinks the amygdala, which is the fight or flight, which is stress, fear, and anxiety. So you're not anxiously trying to find a partner. It also yeah. is a uh, gray matter in your hippocampus, which is introspection and compassion, meaning your self-esteem and your confidence is elevated. So you're not going to pick from down here. You've elevated yourself. You've leveled up. So you're picking from up here. So a better quality partner. And then meditation is important to a relationship because if we pick up an overabundance of stress, fear, and anxiety, and we are not shrinking our amygdala down, meaning our amygdala is overactive, we are vomiting that overabundance into to our relationship causing unnecessary fights. Hmm. I have a question, actually, I've heard down a bunch of questions here, but one is coming to mind. So I get asked a lot from people, um, you know, there's a big culture on TikTok of, you know, Mary wealthy, who's rich, who can provide for me, but you know, those men are not that easy to come by unless you live in a big city like New York city. So, um, so anyway, somebody had asked me, and I could ask this a lot, like, what happens when, I mean, because people are like, should you help a man build, I guess is my question. And because I saw my aunts, you know, they married my uncles in their 20s, and all their husbands became multimillionaires through their marriage, and they're still happily married to this day. But then other dating coaches would say never be with a man before he's wealthy. But then they also say that men don't reach their potential to 40. So like, what do you say to a woman who's like, I want to find a rich man, but you know, she might have a great man in front of her who has great qualities that a potential possibly that he'll be successful because he's dedicated, he's hardworking or, you know, basically, I don't know. What is your input on this? What is your advice? Yeah. Uh, so first of all, um, I met mine in the country, in the small city, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so you don't have to be in a big city to find somebody who is hardworking, financially responsible, and wants um, somebody who can help them make all of this happen by facilitating things that it's hard for them to get to, right? And so with my husband, um, and, and by the way, blue collar, like that's the millionaire next door. The blue collar worker who owns their own business is literally the millionaire next door. Um, their money is not in the big house and the newest car and the flashy watch. Their money is in the assets that they have, like hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in their business, growing their business, making sure their business is successful. And they, like my husband, listen, we can sell his property for $8 million. The property that we live on that he bought for 1.3 million seven years ago, we can sell this for $8 million. He drives a beat up Nissan, mm -hmm. right? And so you know, like I say, yes, build with them, but know who you're building with. Don't like, it's, it's not about potential. I didn't look at my husband and say, he has potential. I looked at my husband and said, he has the qualities, Mm -hmm. right? My husband is hardworking. He is financially responsible. He is generous. And so I looked at him and I said, I can stick with him today. I can be with him at this point because I know those are his characteristics to right. be hardworking and responsible and ambitious and long thinking. Yeah. That's kind of how my aunt was with her husband that he, um, he had all those traits, but then, you know, you have these women in their early twenties and they want to find a man who's already a millionaire. And most men in their twenties, unless, you know, my partner came from generational wealth. So he accrued it from his grandfather, great grandfather, that kind of thing. And, you know, so he had kind of that in already, but most men in their twenties don't have that. Right. So they're building their wealth on their own. So, you know, these women are looking for men that are high earners, but there's not a lot of high earners in their twenties. So then, you know, what kind of advice would you give women in that age yes. bracket? And so it's all about, um, you're sacrificing one marshmallow today for two marshmallows tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And these people who are ambitious and hardworking, who are putting in all these hours, like 80 to hundred hours a week, mm 
Mm -hmm. right? If she's complaining that he's not spending enough time with her, she's not sacrificing alongside him. And this type of person is sacrificing. He sacrifices free time, fun time, sleep in time, sex time to put in work time for the long-term goal. And he needs the kind of partner who's going to sacrifice alongside him. She sacrifices time with him. She sacrifices cuddle time, date time, sex time to be a partner in the sacrifice for the long-term gain. So that leads to my next question. I'm sure you've heard the statistic that around 70% of divorces are initiated by women. And, you know, of course, a lot of women will say, well, it was all the husband's fault. If he wasn't such a bad husband, I wouldn't have left. But, you know, you also see marriages. I mean, I've seen it myself that the men are great men. They treat them well, but they they work all the time. The wife gets bored. So she goes out and cheats or you don't spend enough time with me. And, you know, what, I guess, do you think that, um, do you think that women require more to be happy in a relationship than men? Or like, what do you think it is? I think women are gaslighting themselves. Right. And so, so we have, uh, we have, uh, what do you call it? Like the, the greeting card, the hallmark image, right? The Disney image, the movie image of what people should do. And I had somebody in my comments recently, because I, you know, I, I did a video about, because, because these women are saying he doesn't put in the effort, right? I'm lonely. He works all these hours. I want him to be more affectionate. Meanwhile, they've chosen somebody who ranks low in physical affection. I want him to buy me things. Meanwhile, he's paying for her car. And so they're looking at these other things that are happening and they're going, he doesn't buy me flowers. He doesn't, he doesn't uh, schedule a date. He doesn't plan a date. And you know, my advice to them is to make a list of everything that your partner is doing for you, make a list of what you wish they were doing for you, and ask yourself, would I trade one for the other? And if the answer is no, your partner is doing enough for you. But they're, these women are, you know, because they have these things that are infused, like you see TikToks and he, the rose petals and the flowers and the yeah. gift after gift, right? And she's like, well, my partner doesn't care about me because they don't do those things. But the fact is there are men who love you in a practical way. My man put a 2000 square foot roof over my head. My man pays for my car. I don't need him to, but that's how he shows his love. He's yeah. a practical lover instead of this romantic lover, the kind who plans these, you know, air balloon dates and the flower petals and has somebody bake a cake for me. My husband doesn't think about those things. He's a practical thinker. Yeah. I would say that in the archetypes, the manager archetype is the romantic one, the more feminine man who's not as successful and the ruler or more successful masculine men, they show love, as you mentioned, through giving gifts and providing and that kind of thing. Um, cause that's how they give love. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what would you say to a woman who like, let's say, um, I had a situation like this with a client. Um, I just kind of want your input on, on this, but she has a partner that, uh, pays, he gives her a salary every year. And she's like, it's just enough for me to get by. He's very wealthy. He can provide more. And she went to him and asked for more. It's not enough. And he got angry that she was being ungrateful for what he was giving her. Um, and then she found a job on the side to take, uh, working at this company where there was a lot of men and he didn't want her working there because he didn't want her around all these men. So she was like, I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place. Like, do you think that it's fair for a woman to, you know, for her to say to a man, I need more from you. And then him also, you know, he feels unappreciated. Like, how do you, what would you say about that kind of situation? Um, so he's giving her a set amount of money to, you know, as he sees it run the household. Yeah. Is, and that's what the salary is. It's to pay um, her rent. Yeah. And it's to pay her rent and to pay for her gas and they're not living together. No. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's, you know, interesting, right. Uh, is, is that, you know, so it's the gilded cage is what we're talking about. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so she wants to renegotiate how much she's, she's getting so that, you know, so it's paying her rent, it's paying her gas, it's paying her food. 
um, no extra money left over? Like what's, what's the situation here? Yeah, it's not that much left over. I guess after taxes, she makes like three grand from what he gives her. And I think two grand is like her rent and then her nails, her food, her gas, and then like no room for shopping or going out with friends or like, you know, yeah. or like leisurely stuff. Yeah. So he wants to keep her kept kept. Um, and so that is a, that's controlling. Yeah. And you shouldn't be in a controlling relationship. If he wants to pay for all these things, that's great. If she wants to take that money, right? So there's there's a negotiation that's going on here. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm going to give you enough to keep you in the lifestyle I'm comfortable you living. And either you accept what I give you and stay under my gilded cage, mm-hmm. um, or we're going to have some problems. And if you want to be an individual and make your own decisions, we're going to have some problems. And that's what she's doing. She's like... You know, I, as much as I like this gilded cage, I want more for myself in my life. I want to express myself more. I want to do more. And Mm -hmm. so I can't do that under this gilded cage that you're offering me. So I'm going to go get this other job. Now, what she needs to do is go get that other job and get rid of the sugar daddy. Cause that's what he is. Right. (laughs) He's the sugar daddy. The problem is, is that, and then we can move on to another question. I just wanted to see like, cause we were talking about how men don't feel appreciated when they are providing and what do you do when he is providing and she feels it's not enough, but you know, they've been together, I guess for a year, he's her dream man. You know, she really likes him, wants to marry him. And, um, you know, it's hard for her. I mean, I kind of said the same thing to her. He's controlling and, you know, she's agreed that he's a narcissist and, you know, she's, she's aware of the situation and now it's up to her obviously to make her own decision. But I guess, yeah, I wanted to know what your input was on, you know, when somebody is giving, but they're not giving enough in the woman's eyes. No, no, no. He's giving enough to control her. Mm-hmm. Right. And so this is financial control. And, um, if she wants to be in charge of her own life, she has to get rid of the person who's trying to control her. Yeah. So what do you think the biggest issue is in modern dating? Oh, this whole kiss a stranger and hope for the best. Like, it's just insane. It's insanity. I have a question on that. So, so people, I think I've even seen in your comment section, people will say, well, what if you put in the three months and, um, of the no kissing. And then after the three months, there's no chemistry. When you do kiss, you wasted your time. What do you think? Bullshit. Bullshit. Why would you kiss somebody if there's no chemistry? Right. Yeah. Like why, why would you do that? The whole point of the no kissing for three months is, you know, if you felt an initial chemistry and it died off, well, then you shouldn't kiss them. Mm-hmm. If you didn't feel an initial chemistry, but you gave them three months to get to know them and you started liking them and the chemistry grew and you're, you're feeling anticipation and excitement at starting a relationship with them because they are amazing. Cause that's what the no kissing for three months rule is about is who the fuck are you? Yeah. And if you're not what I want and need, if you're not the character, the personality that I need, if you're not a 12 out of 12, I'm not going to kiss you. And so listen, your emotions are going to go through a roller coaster, right? Either you felt something in the beginning and then it went down and then went back up and then down back up. Right. And that, that will happen. Or you didn't feel something in the beginning, right? So you're low and then, oh, and then down and then, oh, right. And that may happen too, or nothing happens. But if you get to the end of three months with somebody and you're not feeling it, then you don't kiss them. You go, oh, good yeah. thing I didn't kiss that one. Because the reality is by the time three months is up, you're not feeling it. And it's about yeah. seeing where your emotions rest, get through the roller coaster. Like I said, it will happen because one day you're going to think, wow, this guy's really attractive. The next day you're going to go, man, I I don't, I don't like, he had this thing in the corner of his eye and it really turned me off. Right. And Mm -hmm. and you're going to pull back. Like I've, I've had that with my husband before we kissed days, Mm -hmm. moments where I was like, Ooh, he's so hot. And then other moments where I go, Oh, he's got like a style in his eye. And that's really unsexy. I don't, maybe I'm not going to see him again. Right. And Mm -hmm. so you do go through this, but where do you end up after giving them enough time to really feel out who they are? Yeah, that's the relationships that lasted the longest for me were when we didn't jump in the bedroom. We really got to know each other, like me and my partner are waiting until we get married to have sex. And uh, we've really got to know each other in a very like intimate way, like without messing around, without, you know, being intimate. And 
Um, I've been able to, as you said, see his character and um, how he is as a man. And it's just been a very different experience than, you know, when you sleep with somebody too soon. And I've been in a situation like it just comes to my mind when I was younger that I went out with this guy. I knew right away that I, you know, like he was not for me. And, you know, you're at dinner and you're having some drinks and then you go out after the drinks and then he kisses you. And, you know, so we kiss and I'm like kind of tipsy and you feel a connection when you're when you're drinking. Right. And then I decided, oh, actually, like I kind of, you know, then you build that, as you mentioned, the oxytocin. And so I went out with him again a few more times and um, he was definitely not the guy for me, but I would have never gone out with him again if I would have never like kissed him and, you know, <laughs> gotten to that point. Yeah. Yeah. So the whole point is to not confuse yourself. And also like with somebody who is amazing, like they keep, you know, becoming more and more amazing to you. And mm -hmm. so your fondness is growing. Um, you start getting really inventive in the ways that you show gratitude and appreciation for who they are and what they do for you. Mm -hmm. I like that. Mm -hmm. It makes it a better relationship. What do you think that men can improve on when it comes to dating? Mm. Uh, so what can men improve on when it comes to dating? Well, we all love it when they plan something, right? We just, you know, I listen, I get, I get the non-planners. I really do. My husband is a non-planner, right? Like my husband, listen, right now he's planning on selling his business, moving to Florida, starting a whole new life, starting a whole new business, buying, like buying a location, starting a business, buying equipment, buying a house, right? That's a lot of planning that he's doing. Mm -hmm. My husband is constantly planning, but the planning that he does is really big picture planning. And one of the things that we want them to do is the small picture planning. Well, when you're dealing when you're dealing with a ruler, um, they want to provide the money, but they want their wife to do the planning. They're like, I want to go on this vacation. Here's the money, figure out where you want to go and, and all that stuff. And we'll, we'll show up. Right. And that's the small picture stuff mm -hmm. because they're planning the next house. They're planning the business expansion that brings in more money that pays yeah. for more vacations. So it's not like they're not partaking in the planning process, but there's different areas of planning. And, and I see a lot of women who say, I wish he planned dates. I wish he initiated and planned dates. And, and of course we all want that, but are you aware of the planning he is doing? Are you grateful for the planning he is doing? Because of my husband's planning, the type of homes he's looking at is the kind of house where I can host retreats from, for my business. So mm -hmm. his planning isn't just a nicer, bigger home. It's a home that benefits me on multiple levels, not only in enjoyment, look at this beautiful home, but practically speaking, because that's the kind of man I have. He's a practical man. So he looks at me and he goes, what does my baby need? Not just does she need a nicer bathroom and a bigger room, my baby needs somewhere where she can operate her business from. So what has a big enough office? My baby needs a space where she can sit 15 women in a circle and have group sessions. So what has a big enough living room for her to do that from? Yeah, I love that. So you would say that uh, women, maybe one, one piece of advice for women is to really sit down and think about what they're grateful for, what the man is bringing to the table. All of it. Yeah. Because we tend to have selective viewing. He doesn't get me flowers, right? So we're going to get poopy about that while ignoring that he's currently paying for our car. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So one more question here that I wrote down was, um, or a few more here. Um, oh, what is the perfect age to be married for a woman? I get asked this question a lot. <laughs> My answer is when you're ready, right? If you're with a generous long-term thinker who loves you, a 12 out of 12 in the 12 character traits, makes you laugh more than anybody else, is loyal and devoted and hardworking, and practices the three Ps, which is protect, profess, provide, and people ask me, what's the time frame? And I say, two years, three months. So no kissing for three months, no living together for a full year, live together for a full year before you get engaged and married. And this is to make sure, first of all, that you know the person well enough before you pick them. 
that you navigate ups and downs and resolve conflict before you move in together. And again, after moving in together, because you've changed the dynamic in a major way. So once again, can you resolve conflict together and go through ups and downs? So after two, two years and three months, I don't care how old you are. If you picked yourself this and you spend enough time seeing how you operate together, you're good to go. So you say that somebody should date for two years before getting married. So three months to get to know each other before okay. kissing, not living together for a full year before living together, okay. then living together for a year before getting engaged and married. Got it. Got it. Well, it seems like I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> good stuff. <laughs> okay. So um, um, out of curiosity, though, what was your answer for that? The same. I think, you know, I think it's hard. I I think for women in their early twenties, like we change, I mean, we're always changing, right. We're never going to just stop growing, but I think that, you know, me as a 20 year old is so different in who I choose, how confident I feel like really, truly knowing myself. I think it's hard to uh, choose a partner. If you don't really know who you are, or what your needs are. I was briefly married in my early twenties and I chose like all wrong, all wrong partner for me, you know? And, um, I think, yeah, I think marriage is something you have to kind of prepare yourself for. And, um, I think it's difficult for women in their early twenties to, I think that's the time to like really get to know who you are, go through life's trials and tribulations. And then like 25, I think is maybe a good age to kind of start like looking or, dating for marriage, even though, you know, they say to get married younger for having children. But, um, I, I also see women who have, you know, my mom had my sister when she was like 18 or 19 and me when she was like 21 or 22. And, um, you know, I feel like she went through this kind of like period in her life when we got older, where she was like, okay, I'm going to go wild now. And kind of like, you know, cause she never, got that, I guess, because she was a mother so young. So I think it's kind of good to explore yourself, explore your life. Like I saw you traveled, you posted some videos of you traveling the world and, you know, you have this full life and full kind of, um, you're well-rounded more, I think when you get older and more secure in yourself. And I think it's a better time, I think like 25 and older, maybe. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, like we, you know, like we see people now who are like, not ready to get married till they're in their thirties, not ready to have kids until they're close to 40. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things have changed in terms of how we are viewing ourselves and our development, because it used to be lifespans were shorter. Um, And so it was like, hurry up and get those kids and get married. Right. So you're Mm -hmm. like your mom, right. You're getting married and you're having kids. And I mean, back in your mom's day, like if you were 24 and not married, it's like, girl, what's wrong with you? Yeah. Right. And like, here we are now going 24 and getting married. You're so young. Yeah. My my grandma's always like, you better hurry up and have kids. Like, see, like you're getting old. And I'm like, thank you. You know, but I'm, I'm 32. I'll be 33 in April, but, um, I'm just like, you know, it's just, it hasn't, you know, I'm not going to have kids with somebody just to have a child. I always said that I would never have a kid just to have a kid. I've seen way too many horrible situations. So I found my partner who's such a family man. He's the oldest of eight kids. He raised his siblings. He wants a huge family. We have all the money to provide. So, you know, it's just, I'm so happy I waited and I met him at 31, you know? So, um, yeah, I guess I met him when I was 31. I met him on my 31st birthday. So, um, you know, people say like Kevin Samuels, I'm sure you've heard, he says, when you're older than 30, you lose your value or high value men don't want you. And it's a crock of shit. (laughs) (laughs) It's such a crock of shit. It's (laughs) such a crock of shit. Oh my God. Let's, oh fuck. Can we take their microphones away? Cause they just need to stop talking. <laughs> I like some of his advice. I don't really like his delivery, but, um, 
you know, he's, I've seen a little bit of his stuff, but there's like those guys from fresh and fit. I watched one of their episodes. Somebody was like, you need to go on their podcast. And they were saying how high value men get the privilege to cheat and have many women because they're rich. And that's their reward for being rich is to have all these options. And you have to just accept it. You just have to accept that all rich men are this way. And I'm like, it's not true. Like I have so many wealthy men in my family who are so devoted men who would rather be on their farm alone than in a city with, you know, sugar babies or whatever. And it's all about somebody's value and character. It doesn't have anything to do with the money that they earn. Yeah. And, and let's just be clear, high value to who, to who, right? And this is where you start thinking, you know what, these boys, these guys are more intent on impressing each other. Mm. because it's not high value to us oh the one who has all these options and can go like cheat on me at any second you think that's high value to me Mm -hmm. to me no you're not talking about me when you say high value you're talking about yourself and what you admire so go sleep with them my boy because it's not valuable to us women so obviously you boys want to be valuable to each other so go be valuable to each other because you're not valuable to us Right. Do you think that men, I mean, I know I've heard a lot that men can have sex without getting feelings attached and women can't. Do you think that women can actually have sex without getting attached? Hello. (laughs) (laughs) Hello. Absolutely. And here's the thing. It's all about where your brain is at when you go and interact with these people. When my brain was in the state of no fucking way am I getting in a relationship because I don't want it. I was kissing and having sex with whoever I wanted to. And attachment was not forming. And unfortunately, they were getting attached to me. And I'm like, no. That happens, (laughs) yeah. But when, if there's an inkling, if if there's a teeny smidge of my brain that says, I'm lonely, I want a relationship. And I kiss and have sex with somebody. My brain goes, what about that one? And it's spinning on that person. So it is 100% about where your brain is at. And if there's a tiny little bit that thinks I want a relationship, do not kiss and have sex with strangers because you're going to fall for them. Yeah. And that's when we do the bad picking. (laughs) That's when we do the bad picking a hundred percent because, because we pick with lust, right? I find you attractive enough. The criteria for hookup is two. Do I find you attractive enough? Do I trust you enough to take you home? Right. Mm -hmm. And so we pick them with the criteria of two, but because part of our brain says, I want a relationship. We start going, how can I pull you into relationship mode without regard of whether or not this person is even right for us? Yeah. Are you in Canada? Currently? Yeah. I say, okay. I say currently, cause my husband might be moving us to the U S so yeah, we'll cause you mentioned Florida. So I wasn't sure. Yeah. Are you Canadian? Like were you hundred percent? Yeah. Although here's the thing though, this is a funny thing I've been saying. I'm not sure I'm 100% Canadian because I hate the snow. Mm. So not I like yeah. I mean, Canadian born Canadian made, but really Canadian. I think I might be a Floridian by, at heart. Yeah. Have you been to Florida? I've been a few times. Um, I actually spent three months in Florida a few years ago. Um, I love the heat. Give me the heat. I will, I will complain about the cold and the snow every single fucking day. I'm <laughs> telling you every single day. I'm like, I, it snowed. It's snowing now. I looked at the window. Oh it's God. supposed to be double digits. I'm like, what the hell's going on? This, this stuff yeah. is supposed to melt, right? So at heart, I'm a hot weather girl. Yeah, my dad and my stepmom was from Montreal, and uh, we had a house up there. My dad uh, lived up there for a little bit, and he said when he would go outside, his hair would freeze if it was just a little bit damp from the shower, you know. And I couldn't, I couldn't do that. So I've had a, a few ra- like raves, right? Back in the day in Montreal, I, I used to be a stripper, so I would I would do my shift, and then I go straight to the after hours. And I would, I'd be dancing away the after hours till like noon when they closed and, you know, like your hair gets frizzy because of the humidity. Some people are going to remember the old school after hours where it gets nice and humid in there. Right. So my hair would get frizzy. So I'd go into the bathroom and I like wet it down a little bit. And so sometimes at the end of the night, because the humidity in me wetting, I'd go out with like wet hair and it's free solid. 
Yeah. What is something you learned when you were a stripper from men? I know I, I've talked to a lot of strippers who say they learn a lot from men when they work in those environments. Yeah. So I learned the most actually after I met my husband, because my husband is a certain type of man. And I hadn't been aware of that type yet before I'd run across it, but I didn't have the scientific awareness of it. Um, and so here I am now in my thirties, uh, meeting the specific type of man. And, um, this is how I formulated the generous long-term thinker versus the selfish short-term thinker. Once I really became aware of this type of man, who's the sacrificing, hardworking, uh, generous and responsible. Um, I kind of, you know, sort of really looked at him as a certain sort of entity. And I said, how do other men compare to this? And I was able to really see the difference between what I call a generous long-term thinker and a selfish short-term thinker by sort of studying them objectively in terms of behaviors instead of interacting with them in terms of, you know, people, um, which obviously I still do, but, you know, just sort of standing back a little bit going, how would I categorize this one? And asking the questions and getting to know them in such a way that gave me the inside scoop into who they were. And so um, I would say that the greatest um, thing that stripping brought to me was aside from adventure and money, of course, and meeting incredible people, um, is the ability to put my social, like my, my, uh, my, my study of sociology and psychology and anthropology and biology and evolutionary psychology, taking these, these social sciences and being able to apply them over and over and over again, being in an environment where there's constantly a lot of men coming through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, did your, did you meet your husband when you were a stripper? I did. Right. And, and this is like, listen, do you see my face here? This blows my mind as much as it blows yours. Right. And so when people say, where are the good men? Because I met mine in a strip club, I say they are literally everywhere. You, you met him there? I met him there. He was my client for two and a half years. I say, you know, when, when I talk about different archetypes, I say that the ruler is the one that will marry a woman who's a stripper. And, um, I, yeah, there we go. <laughs> well, what, what do they appreciate about the woman who's a stripper? Um, rulers love women with strong sex appeal and strong feminine energy. And that to them is very alluring. So a woman who's a stripper, she's, you know, she has, she's in touch with herself. She's in touch with her sensuality. She doesn't have any, um, you know, she's not shy about it. She can be, um, you know, very feminine, very alluring to the ruler. And, you know, rulers don't care. Rulers don't marry women because she's got like four degrees and she's successful and rich. And, you know, he, he doesn't need the boss babe type. He wants a woman that's going to be sweet, loving, sensual, uh, be that place where he can open up emotionally. And, um, you know, when you're in a profession where you are being, you know, sensual, luring, that kind of thing by nature, they know that, okay, I can have this too in, in her. I know she has it in her to like, you know, satisfy me and my desires. Yeah. Well, he certainly gets all that from me. <laughs> <laughs> and I am proud to provide it because he's so deserving, right? Mm -hmm. like, Here's the thing. Um, when you choose the right partner and you are the right partner, you bring out the best in each other. And yeah. so he, he brings out this side of me that is very feminine, is very nurturing, is very caring because I look at everything he does and I go, he deserves this. Mm -hmm. He deserves to be rewarded. Right. And I, and I reward him with my kisses, with my body, with my sensuality, my affection. I, I dote on him with affection. I, I reward him with my services. I make him meals. I deliver it with a kiss, right? Um, when he says, baby, can you? I'm like, yes, I can. Even though sometimes I might forget to do it for a week or two. I always say yes right away, right? <laughs> and so, you know, and that's because he is so hardworking. He is so generous. He is so accommodating. I got my car stuck in the snow drift here, uh, getting out of the driveway the other day. And um, I was like, fuck it. It's, it's, listen, we got double digits coming in the, in the next four days. It'll melt off. He came in and I'm like, don't waste your time. It's going to melt out. I got other cars I could drive in the meantime. No, he came in, he took it out. 
because yeah. you know like that's my baby's car my baby gonna have Aww, a car. I yes. yeah I, I agree though that you can you know people ask me too where do you meet successful men and where do you meet these kinds of men and you know I went to this hole in the wall um, bar one night in New York City and there was a group of like Saudi princes there that I ended up meeting and befriending and it's just like like you said they're everywhere I don't I'm like I don't know of a place just show up just go live your life and you know go to um go to nice lounges if you want or you know I met my guy online actually and I know a lot of people dump on dating apps but we met during COVID when nobody was socializing and his friends were kind of like nudging him to go on there on this app so um he did you know he's traveled the world and couldn't find his empress as he says and when he met me, he said, I finally found my empress. And this was the name of my business. And I was like, oh my God, like, do you watch me on my YouTube channel? And because I had a YouTube channel prior. And he's like, no, what are you talking about? And so it was kind of mystic how it happened. But um, yeah, like you said, I think when you're like ready and you're in good energy and you're feeling great, when you go out, you're going to attract in great people no matter where you are, you know? Yeah. You manifest, you 100% yeah. manifest. And I, I get people in my comments who say, um, I don't think anyone is ever going to love me. And I'm like, honey, bunny, you better change what you're saying to yourself because this is the life you're creating. Yeah. Yeah. What would you say to a woman who is living at home at 25 and never been on her own? It's time to adult. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is that you? Me? <laughs> 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 no, uh, no, no. Yeah. It, it's okay if it's working for you. But yeah. if you're 25 and at home and you're complaining that your parents are overbearing, um, yeah. right? My parents don't let me do things because yeah. I live at home. Then, sweetie, it's time to adult. It's time to become independent so that you can direct your own life. Because as long as you're still living under your parents' roof, guess what? If they want to say my rules, they get to say my rules. Yeah. I moved, I went to school on a farm. I'm from North Carolina and uh, I moved to New York city for college when I was 18. And for me, it was very easy because my parents were divorced and we had like a traditional family that kind of, you know, when I became a teenager, wasn't as close, I guess. So I was able to kind of like flee the nest. I'm an adventure seeker by nature. So for me, I was so excited, but um, I have had clients who, you know, are women that want to get married and they're, you know, still living with mommy and daddy and they're like mid to late twenties because of their culture. A lot of them, it's, you know, they're Indian women or uh, middle Eastern women and that kind of thing. And um, yeah, I would say the same, you got to kind of go be, do you think you should live on your own first before like in your own house before getting married to like take care of yourself? So I know where there's cultures where this doesn't happen, yeah. right? So I'm not going to say you should. And, and in these cultures where this doesn't happen, there's a lot of parental support with the marriage, mm -hmm. right? So these are people who typically have arranged marriages. And so they are, you know, helping arrange their children's marriage. But the parents have gone through that experience of having their marriages arranged and having their parents teach them how to get through this process. And these couples learn to love each other. So I'm not, I'm not going into other people's culture saying what they're doing is wrong. In fact, those marriages tend to outlast, you know, your, 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 our standard marriages today, because we kiss strangers to see where it goes. And we have no outside help of people saying, you need to learn to love each other. This is how you can do it. I understand your tough spots. This is how we got through them, right? Yeah. So not getting that support and that counseling from their parental figures. Um, so, you know, if, if this is your culture, work with your culture, if you're happy working with your culture, but if you do not subscribe to the same religion and culture that your parents are trying to bring you up in, then go get your independence. Don't stay home and fight against it because that's not fair. They're paying for your bills. They're paying the roof over your head. They're providing for you and you're fighting against them. If you want to be an individual, go be an individual, but don't take advantage of people who are paying your way. Yeah. Um, my old boss used to say he's Persian. He used to say, you know, you need to just find a rich man who will provide for you, treat you well, and you learn to love him over time. You know, he's like in his sixties and uh, he's like, that's how a marriage works. You find somebody that can, you know, provide for you the foundation. And, you know, because of his treatment, you learn to love him over time. What do you think about that advice? So, yeah, 
but you don't have to marry them before you love them. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, and that's, that's every relationship is you meet somebody and you learn to love them over time. That's the no kissing for three months dating rule right there is can I develop fondness for you before I even kiss you? If not, why should I kiss you? Right. So this philosophy is a true philosophy. It's just, you don't need to marry somebody you don't love and then learn to love them. You, you know, which, I mean, that's arranged marriages. They don't know each other yet and they do learn to love each other and that's fine. Um, but I do agree. Find yourself somebody who's ambitious, who is financially and, responsible. And also I, w- I have a question for you. What are your thoughts on when, um, cause you know, we see a lot of these questions and I got one the other day of, um, women who want to move in with their boyfriends and their boyfriends want her to split the bill. And then dating gurus would say, no, don't do that. You're, you'll be a roommate. Do you think it's okay for a woman to do 50, 50, or do you think that that's setting herself up for sabotage because he is viewing her? How do you know when it's love or he's viewing you as a roommate? Right. Um, so first of all, what is the treatment before they move in together? Right. Um, is it lovey? Like, is he a good partner or is he saying, let's move in together to save money, right? Yeah. People who move in together to save money and then get married, eventually these, this is the percentage. This is, this is that high percentage rate, that high divorce percentage rate is the people who move in together in practicality and then get married down the road. They're going to be like, this ain't working for me. Mm-hmm. They didn't move in together because they loved each other. And, and this is part of the building a life process. It's like, this is a good way for us to save money. I was just wondering, you know, what your thoughts were, if, if, the, if it's a good yes. idea for a woman to do 50, 50 with a man. Uh, I did 50, marrying. right. I did 50, 50 in my first marriage. Um, you know, he worked a 40 hour a week job, you know, in, in some couples that's each of them are working full-time jobs. And so doing 50-50 seems like a practical way of splitting everything, the finances and the chores. Um, You can, listen, if they're paying 50% of the bills, they need to be doing 50% of the household chores. Do not be taken advantage of where somebody says they want to do 50-50. They pay 50% of the bills, but you're doing 80% of the chores. You need to have a conversation with them where you say, listen, I've been tracking what's been going on for the last 30 days. You, I'm paying 50% of the bills, but doing 80% of the chores. You need to take over 30% of the chores, or I pay 30% less into the bills, or you pay somebody to do your 30% of the chores. Those are your three options, but there is no option four where this continues as it's going and you're taking advantage of me. Not gonna happen. I will leave if you don't choose one of these three options and put them into operation immediately. Um, Immediately. I saw this creator on TikTok who, she, she outed her husband because he doesn't know how to do laundry. She was so angry. She's like, I've tried to have him do laundry. He, he doesn't know how to do it. He weaponized incompetence. Uh, I even put on the whiteboard how to do it. We went to therapy. The therapist gave an idea on how to do it. And of course, all the women were like, how dare he? How dare he? But then it came out that she didn't have a job. She was at home full time, just doing like her hobbies and stuff. And this man was fully providing for her. And I thought that that was a little unfair that she was trying to force him into doing laundry. What are your thoughts on that? It's very unfair what the percentage you don't pay, there's two burdens and I don't count kids. Kids are 100, 100, Mm -hmm. right? But other than children, there are two burdens in a household, the financial burden and the physical burden. The percentage you are not contributing to the financial burden is the percentage you are responsible for, for the physical burden. So she's paying 0% of the financial burden meaning she's 100% responsible for the physical burden. And that means washing the clothes, folding it, putting it away. Yeah. I had had commented actually on the video and she was like, well, I paid for him to go through school like seven years ago or something. So now we're talking about a negotiation, a long-term negotiation. And that, and, and so, so how much did she pay? Right. How much Mm -hmm. did she pay? What was the division of labor at that time? Because there should be a negotiation. I will pay for you to go to school for four years. You will pay all the bills when you get your job for four years. Mm -hmm. Right? So 
And, and and again, while she was paying for him to go to school, what was the division? What was the division? Like, was she paying for him to go to school, paying for the bills, doing all the labor? Well, then in that case, he should be paying all the bills and paying for someone to do the labor. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't get that far into it, but I thought it was a little bit of um, a mismatch there. So to close this out, I guess, um, you know, we I have a lot of great nuggets of wisdom from you. I knew I would. She's written a lot of books um, that look amazing. I know actually some clients of mine have read them. I bought Fix That Shit. And then I, I did read what you had mentioned about you and your ex-husband driving down the driving down the road. And you yeah. mentioned it last time. And um, whenever I get books, I like to, I bought the book the day before uh, we had talked. So I didn't really get a lot of time to read into it, but it's very thorough. You know, you go over a lot of information. There's a lot of chapters. There's a, there's a lot of wealth of knowledge and it just blows my mind that you've written so many books. Like you're on fire. I'm trying to finish one and it's like so hard. I think if this is coaching with me. Yes, I, I will definitely have to do that. Uh, what's your favorite book that you've written? I always say fix that shit because I was fixing the shit while I was writing fix that shit. Mm -hmm. So there's very, you know, like you guys don't understand how many poignant moments there are in that book moments where something just happened and I turned it into a chapter. There's a lot of those in that book where, um, intuitively I had an understanding of what to do. I applied it. It had the desired outcome. And I was like, wow, this is gold. And then I just went and wrote it into the book. And this is like this book, like I said, I was fixing the shit while I was writing fix that shit. This book is the reason I'm with the man I'm with today. It is the reason my -hmm. husband and I are together and I love him so much. He is the most perfect human being in the world. Sorry to all the other dudes out there, but I got the best one, right? Sorry to, sorry to all the other women out there. I got the best one. And I know each and every single one of you who are following my advice, who are finding your perfect partner, you're going to look at yours and go, sorry, all you ladies, but I got the best one. And that's my goal for you is for you to end up in a relationship with somebody and you look at them and you go, man, nobody else cares to you. And so I'm happy that I fixed that shit because if I hadn't, I wouldn't be where I am today. Yeah. I, uh, you know, I, struggle with issues with my mother, the same way you've talked about, um, very difficult relationship. It's definitely been my karmic lesson. I have a wonderful, I mean, both of my parents are wonderful in their own ways, but, uh, very close with my dad. Uh, my mom and I have a very strained relationship since I was younger. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a lot of the issues I had with her, you know, of course it comes out of my relationship. Um, in different ways, like abandonment issues or feeling, you, you know, all those things that you feel whenever you have a parent, that's a little bit, um, not, uh, all there with you, I guess. I, I don't, I don't really want to like go into great detail, but you know, you know what I mean? And then you get in a relationship and, and they say a lot of people, I'm Buddhist, I've been Buddhist for over 10 years. And people think that, oh, you're Buddhist, you're supposed to go meditate by yourself. And, and no, actually, Buddhism teaches that you can only change your karma in a relationship around people, because how do you know you're going to get triggered when you're by yourself? No one's triggering you. No one's actually like showing you, mirroring you anything, right? You know what you need to fix when you're in a relationship and they're doing something or saying something or something's coming out and you feel so bad. And you're like, where does that feeling come from? Because it's, it's not always them. It's something deeper you have to look at and you, you know, you do your greatest self-development work. I think when you're in a relationship. Absolutely. So. Yeah. I a hundred percent agree for the same reason, right. Is that I used to be a dog trainer before I was a people trainer. And so when you were trying to undo negative behaviors, like lunging at other dogs, um, how are you going to undo the behavior unless you're faced with the behavior and then you get to address it in the moment so that you can recondition? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That's what I love so much about my partner. He's the most patient, loving, kind. he's just so kind. He, he's never been rude to me. He's never raised his voice at me. You know, I say I'm, this is the first time I've been in a relationship where I'm kind of the crazy one and my partner's like the solid, he, he has a secure attachment style. You know, he grew up in a really great family. His parents are still uh, married and, um, it's just, you know, and now I see like 
my wounds even deeper. And I'm like, I have to fix this because if I don't, I'm going to sabotage something with a man who's been so patient, so loving. I mean, he's like, let's go to therapy together. You know, like he's so, um, but he never tells me like, you're the problem. He never says he's actually never criticized me before. I see it because I've been on a spiritual journey for so long that I know how to self-reflect and see where like I've been wrong. And he's never made me feel bad ever about anything I've done any of my passionate tantrums he calls it that I have sometimes you know he calls me Miss Passionate he's just like my solid rock and I've never had a relationship like this before I've always had men that were explosive were abusive uh, uh, verbally abusive like my mom was uh, alcoholics you know and when I really did the work on myself and was celibate for many years and really did the healing I attracted in a really great partner. So, you know, as you mentioned, meditation, uh, when I work with women too, you know, I always say the most important thing is really to, you have to do the work, right? Yes, you do. hundred percent. Well, thank you so much for, it was such a lovely conversation. I also saw you have a retreat going on, which you haven't really advertised, but I saw that when I was looking through your stuff. So I did, I did a lot of advertising initially. Um, we're almost sold out except for two rooms in the second week. So I am going to start talking about this some more. Um, but it's a relaxation retreat. It's in Costa Rica. It's January 2023. I've rented an incredible house right on the water. Um, an absolutely stunning place. And I'm bringing two people with me who are going to uh, coach alongside me. Um, so, you know, I'm doing the life coaching and these other two women that I'm bringing are cooks. So they're going to cook three incredible meals a day. Um, and also one of them is a fitness expert and the other one can teach mindful eating. So between the three of us, we're really going to do the mind, body, soul combination. Um, and then because it's a relaxation retreat, it's like, it's loosey goosey. So like, it's around your schedule. So yeah. do you want to go do some tours? When do you want to have your daily coaching session? It's up to you to like, you know, to, to have this your way, but I do want to do a working retreat, which is, you know, Friday afternoon till Sunday evening, every hour is scheduled with things that are really kind of bringing your old shit to light, getting it out, processing, getting through it. It's going to be super intensive. When I say working retreat, I mean, we are working, uh, yeah. you're going to go through a lot of emotions. I have a client. Well, one thing I looked at your pricing and I saw is it's actually affordable uh, to go to the Costa Rica. Is it, are you paying only for the room, the 400 a night? Yeah. So that's, uh, so every room has a private bathroom um, and opens up to the ocean. You can hear the waves from your room. Uh, the house has an infinity pool, um, saltwater infinity pool facing the sunset. So super gorgeous. So it includes your, your room and your three meals a day. And your one hour of coaching with me and whatever coaching you get, the fitness coaching, the mindful eating coaching, all of the coaching is included in that. Yeah, it's a great price. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And I have a client also, by the way, who her um, parents own a beautiful boutique resort in a gorgeous part of Mexico on the water. And she asked me, she's like, have you ever thought about doing a retreat? Um, and I looked at the pictures, it's gorgeous. So if you ever want to do a retreat in Mexico, I can connect you with, uh, these, um, people <laughs> and you can look into it. Me a link to the resort. Let me take a look yeah. at that for sure. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. It's always so nice talking to you. You have great energy. And I just love when I see your content, I always agree with everything you say. And that's kind of, you know, what are your thoughts actually on the book? Have you read the book? Why men love bitches? A long time ago, like too long to really remember what I read in it. Yeah, that's how I felt too. I did a review. I probably should have like reread it a little bit before I did a review on it, um, saying I agreed with some of it, not others. And the author commented on it yesterday. And she was like, is this influencer who does nothing or what did she say who all she does is seek attention on TikTok or something really saying that my advice wasn't humble. Ha ha ha. Like, so, what like like she caught like the author of the book oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. so I did another I did a response video because I didn't want to like tear her down or anything but I was like you know I agreed with some of it and and not with others and I think that that's I understand people they put out personal information and when you when somebody kind of disagrees with it it can feel 
like a personal attack. I understand. Um, but it, it was a little aggressive, but, um, I just wanted to know what your thoughts were on the book, but if you haven't read it in a long time, then there's, you know, there's no need to even talk about that. Right. But, um, well, awesome. Well, thank you so much. And I will see you in the near future. I'm sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. We'll be doing this again. My love for sure. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Well, have a great day. Always such an easy conversation. You have a great too, great a great day too. <laughs> yeah, it's been a long day. <laughs> Bye. Bye.